if you do want to play, then you need to start finding excuses to practice and not reasons to not practice. Hello, my name is Matt Willis, and in this web series, we're going to be talking about tips and strategies to make you a stronger and more confident piper. The biggest obstacle standing in most pipers' way is practice, or the lack thereof. Sometimes it's motivation, but more often it's time and location. The pipes are loud, and we have to make arrangements, whether it be with our family, in our lives, or whatever it might be, so that we can get the practice time we need on the full instrument. So today we're going to be talking about strategies that we can use to get more practice time in. And how much practice time are we talking about? Well, I'm a professional player and I strive to get 60 to 90 minutes a day of practice time on my full pipes. And notice I'm not talking about the practice chanter, I'm talking about the full pipes. If you want a rich, steady, and confident sound on your instrument, then you need to be putting time in on your actual bagpipes. But how much time are we talking about here? Well, obviously, there are pipers of all levels, and that's okay. Uh, not everyone needs to be a professional player. But what if you're just a hobbyist, so somebody who is playing the pipes for their own enjoyment? What kind of practice should you be putting in? Uh, in my opinion, you should be putting in probably three 30-minute sessions a week as a minimum on the pipes. And that would be enough to keep your current skill and sound, um, I would think, pretty stable. If you wanted to improve, well, you would probably have to find more time. But that's about 90 minutes a week on the actual instrument. And I think that would be a good start for the hobbyist player. Now, what if you were in a pipe band? What would that practice time need to look like? Well, I would think it'd need to be four days a week at 45 minutes to an hour. When you're in a pipe band, there's a lot of repertoire you have to have memorized and you have to have ready under your fingers. And you need to be able to blow a confident, steady bagpipe and have the stamina enough to make it through a full rehearsal uh, or a full extended performance because they do come up. So what we'd be looking at, that would be around three to four hours a week you would need to put in on the pipes. What if you're a competitive piper, whether it's solo competitor, pipe band competitor, it, it goes up from there. Um, what you're expecting out of your own playing is being held to a higher level and you're going to have to make the time to do that. So what would you be looking at? I would think, ooh, probably either 60 to 90 minutes four times a week on the pipes or 45 to 60 minutes five times a week on the pipes um, if you're really serious about moving your playing forward and being a serious competitor. Uh, and more would be better. Um, so now we're talking that's four to six hours in a week. That's, that's quite a bit of time. But let's not forget, music is a temporal art form. It exists over time. There's no shortcut for that time. If it's going to take you 100 run-throughs of a four-minute set to get it at the level it needs to be, that's 400 minutes of time, and you can't shortchange that 400 minutes to get there sooner. So let's talk about one of the situations you might find yourself in, the polite family member. Now, this is assuming you live in a home with walls that are not shared with another family or an apartment. And if that's the case and you lived with other loved ones, you might find yourself not motivated to practice for fear of annoying your family members. Or maybe you've even been outrightly told that they prefer it when you don't practice when they're around. The suggestion there is to just sit down with your family, with the people you're living with, and let them know what you need out of your practice time and see if you can come to a compromise. Let's say you want to practice four times in a week for 45 minutes each. Well, that might not be possible at home, fitting everyone's needs and concerns in, but maybe you can get two in there. Two is better than none, and I don't think it's unreasonable in a normal kind of household. That said, there are households that have uh, other issues. Maybe there's a loved one with sensory processing issues and the sound of the pipes is really more than they can take. That doesn't mean that you don't have any reason or right to practice. It just means you can't do it at home. Uh, and it puts you in the group uh, we'll talk about next, which is 
the apartment dweller. Now, the apartment dweller has lots of issues. The biggest one being you can't play at home, uh, or I don't recommend it unless you want an eviction notice. So if you're an apartment dweller, what are you going to do? Well, there's a number of possible suggestions I have here. And for eight years, I was an apartment dweller while being an active gigging musician. Musician? Musician. Musician. So I know it's possible. So the first option I would suggest is going to your office and seeing if you could use the clubhouse or whatever other uh, communal facility your apartment might have. It might involve a small fee. It might involve a large fee. Well, if it's a large fee, then I probably wouldn't do it. Uh, if it's a nominal fee, it might be worth considering. Now, that said, I lived in four apartment complexes over the years, and only one of them let me use their space, though they did let me use it for free. And it was great. I could just walk to the clubhouse, get my playing in. And the most important part, if you're going to have this conversation, is let them know that you're willing to be flexible because they're going to have other people willing to pay far more, most likely, to rent out that space or use that space. And if you show that you're willing to be flexible with your time, then it'll go a long way to allowing them to consider you using that space. But they say no to that. I would say the next option would be churches. Now, if you belong to a church, it makes it a little bit easier. You would probably know who to talk to about times and uh, areas of the facility where you might be able to practice. Again, there might be a fee. I wouldn't assume for it to be for free, but who knows? It might be. Uh, if you're not a member of a church, it doesn't necessarily exclude that uh, you could use a church. I would just give a phone call and see what happens. Let them know that uh, you'd be willing to pay a fee and perhaps even volunteer your time for certain things, a Kirkin of the Tartan or a Palm Sunday Parade or a few tunes before a Christmas show. Things like that can go a long way to helping you have a conversation where you could have an inside spot to practice. And for uh, my Northern listeners here in the States or anybody in inclement weather, the more you can spend inside, especially in the winter, the better. Now, that being said, if the church option doesn't seem to pan out, you can do what I did, which is the park rotation. I would recommend finding seven or more parks, preferably not near residential areas, and kind of make a map of them. And don't just keep going to one park. Kind of go to one, then go to the next, go to the next. I've actually routed out 10 parks. I'll show somewhere on the screen around here for a second. Um, that are all within five miles of my house where I could readily go practice and hopefully not annoy anybody. So if somebody does come up to you at any of these parks and ask you to stop, then I would just stop and go to another park. There's no need to have an altercation or make anything ugly, um, which again, why if you could find one away from residential, that'd be best. All right, so inclement weather. That's the big thing about parks. Uh, you can't control the weather. I recommend when you go and look at any of these parks that uh, you look for covering. You know, see if they uh, have a gazebo or some sort of covered area so you don't have to just play in the sun the whole time. Uh, bathrooms are nice but not required if you plan correctly. Um, if it's raining, you know, I'd often go out in the rain. If it was cold, I'd go out in the cold. Uh, I wouldn't go out in the ice. I didn't feel that was safe, but uh, even a little bit of snow didn't stop me. I typically leave my car warming, uh, you know, car left running and go run in the car and warm up my hands for a couple minutes and jump back out and get my playing in. On this note, if you are going to practice in the cold outside, remember when you're done to take your pipes apart and dry them thoroughly. Have brushes ready, maybe have a large towel ready, but you don't want that moisture building up in your pipes. All right, the next option, uh, music stores or practice spaces, professional practice spaces. Now, this is going to get pricier. I would first start by contacting a nearby music store. Um, the more local, the better, most likely, when it comes to price. You might find, um, they, might, they might say yes, the fee might be okay for an hourly rate. And you go down there and the pipes are still too loud because they often have other learners in there or other people even giving lessons. So you might be asked to leave in after you get there. And that's fine. There's no reason ever making a, a fit about it. Uh, if you wanted to use a professional rehearsal room, these typically don't have volume limits, but they tend to be pretty pricey. I know in the DFW market, um, to have an hourly space that you're able to access could run $250 a month. So that is certainly on the high side. And I would consider the park option or a church option or one of the other options first. 
But it is there for those that uh, money's not an issue. The professional rooms can be great, no volume limit, um, and they're typically open late hours. So you could go in there if you were perhaps a shift worker. Shift workers. I was one of these for a number of years as well in my early days of learning. I worked night shift, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And on the days I worked, it was not a glorious um, existence. What I found myself doing is I would uh, get off work at 6 in the morning, and rather than go hang out and uh, do anything with my coworkers afterwards, I would immediately go to bed, try to get myself asleep by 7.30 or 8 a.m., uh, have my alarm set for 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, get a quick cup of coffee, head out to a nearby park, hopefully just a minute or three away, and then get my hour or so of practice in from 4 to, say, 5 p.m. Then home in time to maybe even take a quick shower if needed during the summer, get a bite to eat, and be on the road for work by 5.30 to get back in and do another shift. Not a huge amount of social life there, but I didn't do it seven days a week, but that's how I got my practice in on those days. That's one idea for night shift, especially extended night shift hours. For someone who works swing shift, I would still do something similar. I would try to get myself to bed at a reasonable hour, you know, instead of hanging out after work, because the late morning hours before you go into shift are a good time to get practice in. I don't recommend going to a park or doing anything outdoors before 9 a.m. on the pipes. 10 is even better. Uh, people should be able to, to sleep in a little bit, not be woken by the skirl of pipes. For the office worker, the increasingly common extended hours office worker, this can be the most problematic. And it's a place where many, many people will find themselves. You go to work at, say, 8 or 9 a.m., and on a normal night, it's 6, 6.30, even 7, before you find yourself leaving and walking to your car. And by the time you get home, you're not going to have the motivation or time to practice. It'll be late. So things to consider, perhaps if you have an extended lunch or a longer lunch, you could bring the pipes in with you to work and don't leave them in your car. Bring them into the office with you if they're allowed. And if they're not allowed, then leave them at home. Don't ever just leave your pipes in the car. Between weather and threat of theft, it's not worth it. But if you can bring your pipes into the office, if you can head out and lunch, hit the top of the parking garage for 20 minutes or 30 minutes and get some time in on the pipes, especially if you can do that every day of the week, that'll go a huge way to improving your tone, stability, steadiness, especially if you're using your practice time effectively, which we'll do a video on next. But um, let's lunch isn't an option, okay? Well, I would then, again, if you can bring your pipes in, maybe hit a park on the way home. Find one that's between you and your house or a couple so you don't wear out your welcome again and get some time in before you even get home. It will still be late but hopefully not so late that you can't practice and you won't have that lack of motivation from heading home after a long day of work and then like, oh, oh now I have to grab my pipes and go back out to a park. It'll probably be too late and you're not going to want to leave. Um, but for some people, that's not even an option. Like the work is too late and there's just not a park or there's no place nearby like that you can do and that's okay too. For that, I would recommend... Uh, several extended sessions during your weekend, whether it's a Saturday or Sunday or whatever days they might be. But something like um, a 45 to 60 minute session at 10 a.m. and then maybe another 45 to 60 minute session at four in the afternoon. And if you could do that on both days of your weekend, well, that's four practices. It's not going to have the benefit of doing that scattered throughout the week. There's something about building it up over time that is crazily, crazily useful. But don't make your inability to do that a reason you don't get your practice in. I would much rather see these weekend practices, you know, morning and evening on both days of your weekend, that you're still going to see huge, huge strides in your playing. What do these all have in common? What they have in common is that you're motivated enough to do the work. In all of these things, it's, it's a pain. There are some musical instruments that are easy to practice. You can sit in a room with an acoustic guitar and strum it quietly and people would maybe even enjoy listening to you practice. There are other instruments where it's easily read, you can just put headphones on and practice quietly. If you have a digital keyboard or something similar, you could be doing all the practice in the world and not annoy anybody. But on the pipes, it's a, it's a woodwind reed instrument. And if you really want to get good at playing your pipes and having the kind of steady tone that I know we're all after, you're going to have to put the time in on the pipes. So if you 
if you can't practice at home and for whatever reason, the thought of doing a park rotation or contacting a church or a music store or any of the things that I've talked about in this video, if that's not something you're really willing to pursue, um, you have to kind of look at why you want to do this. If you don't want to play, that's okay. It's okay. If you do want to play, then you need to start finding excuses to practice and not reasons to not practice. For almost everybody, learning a musical instrument is a sacrifice. There's only so many hours in the day. Um, if you want to be a piper, whether it be a hobbyist, you know, putting in 90 minutes a week or a competitive piper putting in six or more hours a week on the pipes, that's time you're going to have to carve away from other things going on in your life. If you look at your life right now, most of you are not going to find two, three, four hours in a week where you're sitting around doing nothing that you're willing to currently give up. Finally, for some, you simply won't have the time. All other things being equaled, considered, even if your motivation is there and you are willing to go through so many of the things I was talking about. If your weekend is filled with, you know, needing to take your children to extracurricular activities or whatever it might be, no judgment. If you find that all you have time for in your life, realistically, is two 20-minute sessions a week on the pipes, then that's fine. And do that and enjoy that time on your instrument. But temper your expectations of what you expect to get out of the instrument. Somebody that puts in four to six hours in a week is simply going to be moving at a drastically faster rate than you are at 30 or 40 minutes in a week. Some quick thoughts on other solutions. There are electronic bagpipes out there. I know Red Pipes makes a, uh, a great mouth blown whether it be a full Caledonia set that has drones, you know, they're cork, but they look the part, or one of just their, their more classic ones that with a blowpipe that you still have to inflate, it's way better than not doing anything at all. But, and I play a set of these with Rathmore, it's not the same as pipes. Yes, you're going to keep some of your chops up. You're going to keep your face strong. You're going to keep your squeeze pretty good. But it's nothing like actually playing a real set of pipes and all of the things that happen when you have three drone reads, an actual channel read, and have to deal with the realities of all that, with moisture, with all of the things that go with the pipe. So uh, certainly not talking disparagingly about such a great product, but it's not the same as putting in time on an actual bagpipe. The other product that... Uh, should be discussed is the bagpipe mute and you could just look up bagpipe mute I'm not gonna put a link I'm, I'm this is less about gear and more about process but it's just a bag that goes around your chanter and your hands slip into it and it makes it about the volume of a practice chanter or so I've heard I haven't played on one myself but several of my students have and then you cork the drones but you see, we're already kind of running into one of the problems. Having strong, steady drones and the tone that come from them is very important to all of this. So there, there are solutions, and they're better perhaps than just the practice channel because it still involves some squeezing and that you're still getting some time in on, your act, on an instrument. But I would not say it in any way replaces time on an actual bagpipe. Well, there we go. So hopefully you found this video helpful. It's uh, perhaps a bit of a kick in the pants for a couple people. No one likes to be told that they're not motivated enough to do something. But if this video helps give you some ideas on what you can do to get out there and practice, and if this video helps you look at your own motivations for why you're wanting to do this and how hard are you willing to work at making this instrument something that you can be truly proud of, some, something you'd be very confident with your ability to play, well then, that'd make me uh, that'd make me happy. And if so, give a like to the video. I'm going to be putting out more videos like this. There'll be more uh, tips and strategies. Uh, there'll also be other videos upcoming of me just performing on the pipes. So uh, if you want to see any of that, please hit subscribe. And in the meantime, again, my name is Matt Willis, and I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>